we're going to talk about uh, Greenland Ruby and investing in Greenland Ruby and investing in Greenland in the in the wider uh, in the wider context. So welcome. I mean, a lot of people said, "Okay, where where's Greenland?" Um, a lot of people really don't know, and I think after Mr. Trump said, "Let's buy it," a lot of people do know now. But um, this is Greenland, and you see on the map, it's like the size of of of, of South America. It's a two point of 2,200 square kilometers um, and packed under three kilometers thick of ice. And that's where Greenland Ruby is, is uh, exploring and exploiting uh, the Greenland Ruby mine. 55,000 people, pristine, clean, healthy, uh, and a great, uh, great environment. So you see there the little ruby, that's where the mine is. We quickly go through the history and the potential of the mine, the value chain, the opportunities, the major strength and, and the production and the exploration upside and, uh, and the business plan. Um, this is about the story which is of a company which is in real production, which is uh, it's not just a startup, this is already an ongoing organization and we show that later on, including its purpose and, and, and why we think it's a, a great opportunity. But I said this is not just a startup. Here's a long-term history uh, from the early 2000s where we talked about the, the overall uh, sampling, the drilling, the testing, etc. And basically, to cut a long story short, because we only have 20 minutes, um, going into full production uh, two years ago, where the company tested basically the upstream, uh, what is coming out of the ground, what is the color, what, what do we have to do with it, and basically going into the downstream, into the retail market, and understanding the product and the appetite from retail, wholesale, in the jewelry industry. What makes this company different is the fact that they decided as a team to control the whole value chain. So to be able to manage and control from mine to market which is an extremely important differentiation compared to any other gemstone uh, company in, in the world. Most of them just sell their off and actually sort of don't care what's happening later on with, with, with the end product. Greenland Ruby said, we do the mining, we do the sorting and the processing, all done in Greenland. It's very important that we work with the, the local people. The heating and the treatment is done uh, and we can talk about that when you have later questions in more detail. Um, in Thailand, over, over the centuries, people in Thailand have developed the right techniques to do uh, treatment. And uh, the cutting and the polishing is done in the capital of, of Ruby. There's a Jaipur in India, where you have also generations of experience going forward from that point of view. Then the whole sales and marketing is done by Green and Ruby itself. So there are offices in New York, but also in, in Paris. And from there, it's shipped all over the world uh, to its customers. So basically, completely integrated, vertically integrated company. The problem is, and who knows anything a little bit about gem, gemstones in the audience? You know, you know, um, that you know that provenance is an issue. Uh, origin uh, is an issue. Can you imagine that a Tiffany or, or Louis Vuitton these days or, or uh, Signet has a recall action on his pieces of jewelry, because the origin is not supposed what, it, what it's supposed to be, uh, or, or the quality, or even even the whole provenance. So the consumer these days wants to know what he's buying, what she's buying, and why. It needs to have a purpose. And Greenland Ruby offers that purpose, and from from a pristine environment. It's not a commodity. Uh, sometimes people think, well. The gemstones are a commodity. A ruby is certainly not a community. It's one of the most rarest uh, gemstones in the world, even more rare than diamonds, actually. Especially if you talk about, and Magnus will tell, tell that, if you talk about a product which is three billion years old. So the problem is there. The solution is there as well. What I said, uh, Greenland's ruby managed the whole provenance for mine to market, and that makes the company pretty unique irrefutable provenance, standard ethics, European company, European-based company, uh, that, uh, Greenland is, is, is basically protectorate of, of, of Denmark, so the rules and regulations and everything are similar. Um, 
I think, I think this is something what's, what's in the philosophy of the company. This is not just for now, this is not just for tomorrow, but this is the start of an adventure for years and maybe for decades. And Greenland is not just a Greenland Ruby story, but also a kind of a ticket into, into Greenland, which is, which is known for enormous uh, rare earth uh, deposits, of rare earth mineral deposits, and actually a very cooperative government to work with. And that is what Magnus and his company has been doing over the years to establish a great relationship. So the solution is there. And the proof of that solution is there as well. And we talk here about uh, unique stone. So wherever the stone goes, everybody who knows anything about gemology will recognize this as a ruby or a pink sapphire from Greenland. Um, each stone above a carrot will the, is coming with the uh, origin of certificate of origin, and basically uh, every step according to the production is mapped and basically endorsed by the Greenlandic government. Major strength, um, but I said already we can't uh, stress enough the ESG and CSR factors. High tech operation, it's the most modern gemstone factory and, and pr production factory in the world there in Greenland and basically a very strong and, and, and effective management team with uh, loads of experience in mining and in the gem and jewelry industry. Response resource, I can't repeat it enough. And we talked about Greenland being part of uh, Denmark. So it's responsible not by just saying, yes, we, have, we, we follow the, the, the CSR principles, but the company is following these principles because they think it's a good thing to do as a human being, as an individual, and not just as a marketing trick. So we talk about polar sciences. There's a pink polar bear foundation, which is the social responsibility arm of the company. We talk about innovation, sustainability, and we talk about uh, looking at, at the 17 sustainable development goals and basically map all the activities uh, of the company vis-a-vis -vis the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations. This is a little bit of the introduction on the easy side. So this is getting now in the more technical side, so we'd love to hand over to, uh, to Magnus. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eric, for a good introduction, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. I'll go quickly through some of the production numbers so far. As Eric touched upon, we've now been in production for two years. Uh, starting uh, early uh, 2018, late uh, 2017 with production in the mine and the commissioning of the process plant. From this stage, we have produced 13,000 tons of ore in 2018 and 17,000 tons of ore in 2019. And we are currently ramping up with a target to uh, reach the production capacity of the, both the mine and the process plant in 2020, 2021. Uh, so far, this has given us approximately uh, 1,000 uh, grams of uh, heat-treated corundum uh, finally sorted and graded in our sorting facilities in Bangkok. And uh, we are also, uh, over the last two years, installed the capacity to handle our entire production target for volume for the coming years. This being a primary deposit, basically 99% of it has to be heat treated. Uh, this is due to uh, several factors. It heals some of the fractures that are natural in the stone, making it stronger for processing, for cutting, but it also, for some parts of the distribution of qualities, is improving uh, its color and clarity. Basically, this is the same kind of procedure that was known for the Mengshu rubies coming out of Burma uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so it's a well-known procedure, very established and accepted in the end market. From our production over the last two years, we have standardized our qualities, dividing it into two separate lines, one for the transparent qualities and one for the opaque qualities. The transparent qualities are graded into six different grades, going from deep red into light pink, almost white categories. You can see the distribution of the transparent qualities in the graphics here. Approximately 10% of the production so far, very much in line with the numbers in the feasibility studies, 
are being graded as transparent. In the opaque material, we have eight different grades, so also ranging from deep red to light pink, almost white, but we also have some uh, production graded as blue and dark, dark, almost brownish red. For those of you who is not very familiar with sapphires and rubies, basically the, the, the separation between uh, ruby and sapphire is due to, to color. It's the same mineral, both in the corundum family, uh, where, the, where the darker red colors are graded as rubies and the lighter pink will be graded as sapphires. Bit of numbers from our uh, reserves and resources. From the feasibility study, we have approximately 55 million grams of corundum uh, in the life of mine. Uh, the deposit is op still open, both in depth and uh, north and south going. Um, life of mine from today, approximately uh, eight years. We've been producing now for two years and the sea, as explained previously, to reach our capacity within the next year. From the feasibility study, the, the, the ore body is documented with uh, and is NI431 compliant uh, based on 6,500 meters of uh, drill cores. Uh, mainly in two uh, different kind of ore bodies. The primary ore body being ruby bearing minerals is uh, uh, phlogopite and the secondary uh, mostly carrying sapphires is Luca Gabroic. Just some sample photos and you can see from the ore body to the rough products to the cut and polish samples being phlo uh, phlogopite uh, ore body. And the same with the uh, sapphire uh, gabbroic ore body. In addition to our Apolutric mine, we have two, two uh, separate deposits uh, which we are exploring. We have collected bulk samples from those two deposits back in 2017 and are currently waiting uh, permission from the government to do a further treatment and quality testing from these samples. Uh, making it a good upside for, uh, for the business to explore the two next uh, deposits in the, in the future years. They are, both, uh, they are both located nearby the, the infrastructure that is fully invested in and with, uh, with uh, very small additional capex you can reach the two next deposits which will extend the life of mine of this, uh, this project by many, many years. In addition to this, which is a bit extra and outside the, the, the ruby and, and gemstone industry, we also have a, a huge anorthosite complex closely related to the infrastructure. It's just a few hundred meters from the established camp facilities. This has a totally different industrial uh, use and you have today an operating mine producing anorthosite uh, nearby our location in Greenland. Started its production approximately six years ago. No, six months ago. So looking a bit into the market strategy and our distribution strategy, we are looking to work with the different tiers in the, in the market as of today. Uh, we started our uh, market launch with uh, small in individual retailers and jewelry designers to make a presence, to tell the story to the market and to give proof that this is actually a sellable, uh, good quality product with a good story attached to it. As of today, we are working with larger international distributors, jewelry manufacturing partners, uh, online uh, and TV companies, and cruise ship companies to introduce this in larger scale. And we are looking to uh, have a cash flow positive operation this year. Our first launch was with uh, a Danish retailer called Hartmann. He uh, launched his product line late 2018, which was our first international launch of the jewelry collection. Uh, the introduction went very well, and from this stage we have been building on the same concept into different market areas, and we are now selling and distributing our gems to approximately 20 individual retailers and designers worldwide. Within 40 days, 14 days, they sold out the entire collection and is now currently off-taking uh, and has a steady off-take of some of our finest gem material. Uh, this will never count for a large volume of our total production, but this is a good example of how you can utilize the story 
how you can make good profit margins from uh, also some of the more commercial material that we have to offer. And with the right partner and packaging, make this project a huge success. Eric briefly touched upon, this is a great opportunity. Some of the challenges in the gemstone market, we are situated to actually solve. One of the upsides for, from uh, the jeweler perspective is that uh, historically gemstones has been given the largest margins from wholesale to retail uh, prices. Uh, we are, have now proven this with several of our uh, designer and, uh, and uh, individual retailer partners and we are looking to make this more large scale in the next six months. So a bit about the numbers. Uh, as you saw from the production numbers, we are ramping up production this year and the next. And in line with this, we also ramp up our, uh, our sales numbers. We look to grow our revenues uh, this year to make it cash flow positive. And from 2021, we will have strong EBITDA margin as most of the capex is already spent. The infrastructure is uh, constructed, it's in place. And next required capex uh, is going to be in the end, uh, near the end uh, of uh, mine of life for this project. So at earliest in 2023, 2024. Thanks.